Good evening and welcome to this evening's uh, talk by Dr. Maurice uh, Tadros. Um, we're delighted to have Dr. Tadros back with us. She was here in 2012 and a very different um, uh, time in Egypt. Things have changed considerably and uh, we're eager to hear what she has to say about the current situation. So as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Tadros was here in 2012. Uh, at that time, CSI had just recently issued a genocide warning because we were very concerned about the trends in the region following the Arab Spring uprisings. The movements were becoming more secular, uh, more violent, and we had good reason to be concerned about the survival of the Christian communities and other religious minorities uh, in the region. At that time, Iraq was still in turmoil. Uh, there was uprising in, in Syria that was taking a very heavy toll on the uh, minority communities. And also in 2012, there were similar developments in Egypt when the Muslim Brotherhood uh, government was in power. There was increasing violence against, um, against uh, religious minorities, against women. There was a push towards the uh, imposition of Sharia norms. Things have not changed so much in Iraq and in uh, Syria, but they have in Egypt. For better or worse, I'll leave it to you to decide, and I will leave it to Dr. Tadros to help us think through where Egypt is uh, today and what the prospects are for uh, social pluralism in uh, uh, the uh, Egypt of General Sisi and his regime. Dr. Tadros. To start by echoing uh, Dr. John Eibner's thank you to you all for coming here um, so that we can collectively think together um, about the issues that don't just affect Egypt but affect the world. Um, wherever we're based, they have a ripple effect. I'd also like to start by thanking CSI for inviting me again. It's such a privilege and honor um, to be here. And um, I learned so much from the discussions and debates that took place in this room um, when I was last here. Um, I uh, want to be able to engage with um, a number of things. I think um, I want to be able to look at what does the situation in Egypt mean for Syria um, and the region more broadly. I also want to be able to present a perspective that um, hasn't, to my mind, I could be completely wrong, um, given the due attention that it has, which is uh, where do people uh, in the region, how are they responding to the changes that are happening? So we've heard a great deal about the elites, the political leaders, but we have heard very little about the people. We've heard a great deal about the people at the time of the Egyptian revolution in 2011. So we could see people in squares, we could see people protesting, but then the voice of the people seemed to be missing from press reports. And then there was an almost exclusive focus on, um, on political elites except for during elections. And I want to broaden the debate a little bit to look at what has been different ways in which people have been expressing their voice on issues of pluralism um, in the past few years. Um, I won't go a great deal into the history, but I, and perhaps we can revisit history because history is so important. Everything is grounded in history in the part when we have our general discussion. Um, but I want to just remind a very interesting situation in Egypt where within the space of four years, we had four different political leaders. So after the Egyptian revolution in February 2011, uh, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces led by uh, Marshal Tantawi uh, took office. Uh, it was an arrangement that was agreed by the youth revolutionary forces and other political forces as an interim arrangement until such a time that uh, a democratically elected parliament um, comes to, um, uh, to take over. Uh, a year later, uh, we had the uh, uh, President Morsi from the uh, Muslim Brotherhood assuming office uh, from June 2012 until uh, he was ousted from office a year later. 
Then there was an interim president again, who happened to be the head of the Supreme Constitutional Court, um, uh, Adli Mansour, who a judge, uh, obviously, and uh, he was again in office for almost a year, after which uh, the former Minister of Defense under President Morsi came to office, uh, uh, um, General Abdel Fattah Sisi, who continues to be president to this time. Between 2011 and 2014, we saw two major uprisings. The first one ousting President Mubarak, the second one ousting President Morsi. So it's been a very rapidly changing political uh, situation in Egypt. And I think there are some questions which, um, which we, we, we may want to ask ourselves. So, you know, looking at, uh, uh, looking at that first uh, slide, you have uh, army, uh, Islamist, uh, civilian but not elected, very short, and then somebody from an army background. And the first question is, of course, you know, was there any other choice facing Egypt at the time when people revolted other than either an Islamist leader or a military leader? W were there any other pathways that the country could have taken? And of course, it's always very difficult to ask questions about was there something else in history because you know, there are always a, a particular constellation of factors at any point in time which cannot repeat themselves. The other question, um, which is, well, did Egyptians reject democracy when they rose against President Morsi? He came to office through a presidential election. Um, um, why could they not wait for another three years for his uh, tenure to finish uh, before uh, choosing another leader? Did they reject democracy by rejecting a f the, a, 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 someone who came to office um, via uh, presidential elections? The third question has to do with now. Is it as if the revolution never happened? Is it as if the young people who rose, um, who there was a great deal of bloodshed, many lost their lives, many became physically impaired for life, lost eyes, lost limbs, etc. Is the situation now as if there had not been a revolution? Um, and fourth is, what does the situation and what happened in Egypt mean for Syria and the region? Are there any lessons that we take away um, in order when we come to look at uh, future scenarios for Syria? I'm sure you have many other questions and I will try to limit myself to 40 minutes um, so that uh, we have a chance for me to learn from you and for us to engage in a discussion. I'm actually going to start with two stories um, and I'm going to merge these stories to do with issues of gender equality, but also religious pluralism in Egypt. Now, in December 2011, in one of the protests against the military, uh, this woman who you see um, in the slide was fully dressed in a black abaya and a, a, a veil. The veil did not cover her face, but she was fully veiled, and a black abaya is like a, a black gown that covers your, fa your, your body in its entirety in peacefully protesting against the military regime, and she was protesting because she felt that the army was not governing Egypt in a transparent way or in a way that was leading to a democratic path. Um, one of the uh, military personnel whom you see here, and a number of them, um, um, dragged her across, this was in Tahir Square, and in the process removed the veil from her head and, as you can see, exposed her body. Um, now, Fast forward to a few weeks ago, in a poor village in Upper Egypt, an area that is associated with high levels of poverty, high levels of political, economic, and social marginalization, this 70-year-old grandma was also stripped of her clothes. Um, she was grabbed in, um, uh, in the street, um, and three or four men completely removed her clothes and also dragged her across the street. Um, and uh, this is not to suggest that Egyptians like stripping women in public. This is not in any way to make any kind of suggestion about uh, repressive sexualities or anything of the sort. But I want to link um, these two incidents 
because of their importance in what they did to social responses and reactions and how they shaped uh, our understanding of democracy and rights in fundamental ways. Now, why was the woman in 2011 stripped of her clothes? Um, she was stripped of her clothes because I believe that the military wanted to um, uh, send a message to women, uh, enough protests, enough taking to the streets, stay at home, uh, accept our way of governing. Um, why was the 70-year-old the grandmother stripped of her clothes? Because she happened to be uh, the mother of a man uh, who was rumored to have uh, engaged in a relationship with a Muslim woman. Um, and just to say that the Muslim woman uh, uh, had filed a lawsuit against her husband saying that these accusations are false um, and had challenged him to show any evidence of, to suggest that she had engaged in this relationship. And so to, in order to get back at the man who was rumored to have that relationship, who had fled from the village because he had received threats, they decided to avenge by punishing this 70-year-old woman. Um, the, 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 the young woman next to that, to Suad Sebit, who was the woman that had been stripped, who is clad in the traditional farmer clothes. You can see her sitting um, to your very um, uh, right is another member of her family. So uh, I think in both cases, we have a situation in which uh, issues of identity were being contested. In the case of the, the, what became uh, known as the blue bra woman, um, there was, this was a case in which what kind of political community is Egypt going to be was being contested. It was a time in which there was, at that point in time, an alliance between the Muslim Brotherhood and the army, um, and the youth revolutionary movements and others were contesting that kind of alliance. Um, and the message was to women, um, well, accept that we are in power and uh, accept your place. You thought that because you participated in the revolution against Mubarak, uh, that you will, be, uh, you will continue to be allowed to express your voice through protests, well, think again. In the case of Suad Sebit, the 70-year-old grandmother who was stripped a few weeks ago, uh, the message was for the Copts. Um, this was a message of know your place in society, uh, we can get back at you. Um, we, we, will, uh, we will teach you the expression Egypt is to walk next to the wall. In other words, uh, don't assume that you can seek recourse uh, to protection uh, if, if we turn against you as a community. Now, I'm, when I say community here, I mean the direct village community as opposed to the broader Egyptian community. Um, in the case of uh, the grandma, five houses belonging to Copts were burnt on the same day that she was stripped of her clothes. And again, the message was to the broader Copts in the village. Um, now, interestingly, in 2011, the stripping of the young woman uh, generated the largest ever women's protest in the history of Egypt since um, women rose against British colonialism 100 years earlier. I was there in the protest. There were a lot of men. There were women of different ages, of different social classes. Tahrir Square was packed. Um, and it was incredible because um, there was this sense of moral indignation. Um, not, th there wasn't uh, this sense of, oh, this poor woman, this victim, she's being stripped. There was this sense of, um, it is the military that should be ashamed of themselves. This woman will become a heroine, and we will celebrate her, even though, of course, we don't know her identity. So she became iconic of the struggle for liberty. In, in the case of Suad Sebet, the Coptic woman, uh, it generated a sense of unity among different political forces in Egypt who suddenly rose up against the, the, the regime in power and pressed for accountability from the governor of the, the 
uh, of the, the Almenia, where she lives. They pressed for the Ministry of Interior to explain why the, the police failed to protect this woman. And the issue was then turned to Parliament, and there was a, a parliamentary inquiry into how is it that the authorities failed um, in their duty to protect this woman um, in view of the fact that she had reported threats uh, that she and her family had received a day before she was stripped. So there was this precedent alarm signal that had been given. Um, I'm raising these two reactions because, um, because when we're looking at the Middle East at the moment, we don't think of people rising. We don't think of resistance. We think of doom and gloom. There was an Arab revolt. Now there's an Arab winter. People have accepted uh, an encroachment on their rights. And there isn't an acknowledgment that people are actually resisting all kinds of, of violations of their rights in the most powerful ways you could imagine. And they actually need solidarity. They need to feel that the international community is aware of their struggles as people and that, they, that, that there is this sense of celebrating their struggles for liberty. Um, what I would love to say about the case of Suad Sebit is that the Muslims who showed empathy towards her cause were exceptionally large in their numbers. You had m large numbers of the Muslim intelligentsia, uh, large mo numbers of mo Muslim intellectuals, people on Facebook, saying this is outrageous, this is unacceptable, it's clear that this Coptic woman was stripped because she was copped and because she was a woman. So there was a recognition of two kinds of injustices. Gender injustice, the way in which political struggles are happening on women's bodies, um, and secondly, uh, religious unfairness, the way in which Copts are being threatened and terrorized by mobs in their own communities. Um, in terms of justice outcomes, in the case of what became known as the Blue Bra Woman, Field Marshal Tantawi, uh, the first one here, who uh, ha he was this, this was the only instance in which he actually apologized. So during his tenure, there were a great deal of human rights violations against civilians, and he never apologized. But in this instance, after those protests, he actually issued an apology to all Egyptian women. It was the first and only time, and I think I'm raising this because it shows the power and the importance of us to look at issues of gender justice, um, of equality, and not to assume that they will come later after we democratize. They are essential to any struggle for equality, and they are influential. They are able to change the pathway of uh, a country's political order. Um, now, of course, an apology doesn't mean that thing, wrongs have been righted. The uh, military personnel who stripped this woman were never tried, and also, In the case of uh, Suad Sebet, the Coptic woman, to this day, those who stripped her and the policemen who did not uh, act on the, the, the threats that she had reported are not being adequately held to justice. So it's, not, it's a complicated situation. You gain in one thing, but it's not, you, you're not able to necessarily push through the, the kind of equality agenda um, that you want. But, But there is a commonality in both cases. If we look at who were the people who were, who were undermining the struggle for the woman, young woman who was stripped, um, and the people who, uh, in the case of Suad Sebet, who was stripped, who were also trying to not, uh, to, to undermine her struggle to get her rights, we find some very interesting commonalities, despite the fact that we're talking here about a young woman, a young revolutionary woman in Tahir Square, and a 70-year-old grandma in a poor village. The commonalities are as follows. Um, in both cases, the Islamist forces were against both struggles. And when I say Islamist forces, I do not, by any stretch of the imagination, refer to Muslims. I am specifically referring to um, Islamist political forces. In other words, those, those that have organized politically in order to demand the application of a system of governance based on Sharia. 
So there is a part, it's a particular kind of organized political movements and parties, not the general Muslim population. Because as I just mentioned, there was a great deal of sympathy among the Muslim population in Egypt, um, not all, but a significant proportion towards Suad Sebit. Um, in the case of the infamously called Blue Bra Woman, the Muslim Brotherhood, we do have their quotes. This is not rumors. We do have their quotes where when they were asked about why aren't you joining the women and men in Tahrir Square who are protesting against this woman being stripped, they said, well, what was she doing in Tahrir Square in the first place? Why was she there? Um, the other reaction we got was, oh, this woman. I'll just go back to the picture. This woman here, um, she may have been clad in the most, one of the most conservative ways of veiling, a black cloak that doesn't show any aspect of your body, thick black. But why wasn't she wearing any more clothes underneath her cloak? Uh, you know, did she want to expose her underwear? And these were some statements that were made um, that, that I think were important. In the case of Suad Sebit, the reaction was also very interesting because Al Ashar Institution, which is not a political party, but which represents the highest um, uh, center for uh, Islamic learning um, for the Sunni world, uh, Al Ashar, uh, in response, their first reaction to the case of Suad Zebit was, well, can't we get together, shake hands, be friends, have a reconciliation session? Now, in principle, that sounds great. You know, we get, we get people to recognize where wrongs have been done. But the danger in what they were proposing was that this was supposed to be in lieu of taking the case to rule of law. In other words, instead of saying the perp perpetrators must be tried in a court and justice sought, they were saying, well, how about we kind of informally um, agree that we all forgive each other. And um, I think, uh, in addition, uh, I think one of the other common factors in both cases is the security apparatus. In the case of the blue bra woman who was stripped, you had a case of militarized security um, and a case where instead of the security protecting people's right to protest, the security became a source of assault. In this case, the security apparatus, in the case of the Coptic woman, also, instead of defending people's right uh, to live without fear of assault, they failed to protect this 70 year old woman. Um, hold on to these two issues because I will come back to them when I discuss the contemporary situation. But I want to stop here because one of the reactions that that sometimes I get when I engage with these discussions is, well, it's all your fault, you Egyptians. You had a democratically elected president, you had a democratically elected government, and what do you do? You rise against it. Um, and this is where I want to speak about the people perspective. You know, why is it that a year after President Morsi was elected to power, did Egyptians rise against him? And is it the case that had he stayed in power, Suad Zebit, who was stripped of her clothes, could have not experienced what she has? Now, my argument is that twofold. Number one is um, that actually the situation would have been even worse if President Morsi was in power with respect to that Coptic woman, and I'll explain in detail why. And secondly, um, that the struggles for women's equality and for religious pluralism, and when I say religious pluralism, I don't just mean the rights of Copts, I mean the rights of the Baha'is, the rights of Shias, the rights of atheists, the rights of any human being to live according to the belief system that they wish to, um, to, to pursue. Um, why that, uh, why both had actually gone even worse a path, but that in both cases, struggles continue. And again, I, I want you to sort of, to, to, to relate to the way in which there are very strong movements that are actually struggling for justice that we need to engage with. Could it have been different had the Muslim Brotherhood come to power? Um, and why do I feel not? If they were 
democratically elected, it surely means that the people wanted them. If the people wanted them, then perhaps they wouldn't have acted in ways that violated people's rights. My argument is that, um, yes, they came to power via elections, but the ideology of a regime has a huge impact on issues of pluralism and equality. That numbers, people voting you into power, um, doesn't necessarily mean that you will necessarily advocate for an inclusive political order. Um, and what we saw during that year in office when it comes to gender equality and religious pluralism was a severe encroachment um, and a circumscribing of, of space. Um, if you recall, I started by saying in the case of the Blue Bra Woman, the Muslim Brotherhood had said, why was she out protesting in the first place? When they, when they came to office, the rhetoric, the discourse on sexual harassment worsened. So uh, for a lot of uh, Egyptian women, Muslim Egyptian women, who um, may have worn a regular veil but may not have worn the more conservative kinds of veils, they were socially stigmatized. They were being pushed into, uh, they were being regularly pushed on the streets of Egypt to adopt more conservative attire. It was much worse for Coptic women, um, especially if Coptic women lived in poor areas. For these women, not only were they socially stigmatized because they were not veiled at all, but there was reference to their religion. There was this reference to just you wait, we will, we will veil you, we will get you to conform to our Islamic system. Now, this may not have been a law. This may not have been um, a position that President Morsi announced, but this was the regular rhetoric that they were subjected to on the streets of Egypt, in particular in rural Egypt, and in particular in poor urban areas of Egypt. Bearing in mind, of course, that 40% of the Egyptian population are poor. So we're not talking here about a minority. Um, the other issue is, um, um, that with respect to the Copts, uh, I would believe that the case of Suad Sebet would have been even worse because in this case, in the case of Suad Sebet, President uh, Sisi, for better or for worse, apologized to her. He came out in public on national television and said, uh, what happened to you was unacceptable, there should be rule of law applied, and um, uh, we, we apologize to you and to all Egyptian women for what you have been subjected to. Now, I am not, I mean, you know, we have to distinguish between rhetoric and action. You know? Okay, you've said that. Why are people not being held accountable? But my argument is if President Morsi was in office, he wouldn't have even apologized. That we've had cases during President Morsi's tenure where there were severe violations of the Copts, uh, of the rights of Copts, and in which uh, the elite pressed President Morsi to make a public statement to apologize, and he didn't. So what I'm trying to say is to complicate the situation, is to say that the ideology of a regime does matter. And what I'm also saying is that in effect, um, from 2011 to this day, Egypt has never had a democratic country, even though you had elections. You had elections without democracy. Um, because democracy without substantive rights, without rights to the most vulnerable members of a community is not really democracy. And so my argument is that even though you really haven't had democracy and you do not have democracy today, that there are variations of authoritarianism, strands, if you like, different colors of authoritarian regimes, which have a huge impact on both questions of gender equality and questions of pluralism, religious pluralism, social pluralism, and so forth. And my argument here is that the situation during uh, President Morsi's tenure was such that um, there was a, gr a great deal happening on a grassroots level that were not being captured um, through um, uh, uh, um, sta public statements, official policies, and laws, because they had to do with everyday living. The other issue that I think uh, was very important um, is the issue of citizenship under President Morsi. Now, there were no laws issued during President Morsi that discriminated between Christians and Muslims, absolutely none. 
However, it was the daily practice. It was the, the sense of suddenly living in a country which does not belong to you because the, the daily rhetoric was just, we will show you Copts, now that we are in power, who is going to rule. And part of that kind of avenge, you know, avengeful, revengeful rhetoric came from the fact that Copts did not, did not uh, vote for President Morsi. Um, that the majority of Christians um, were, some of course did, but the majority of Christians were against an Islamist rule because informally they had experienced the impact of Islamist political movements creating divisions in, in their community, informally. So this was a case in which they've come to power. They could have adopted inclusive uh, politics on a social level. In other words, say, right, we will show them that there is an Islamic democracy that is inclusive of all, that does not put qualifiers with women's rights, um, that does not distinguish between Christians and Muslims. Um, unfortunately, this was not the case. Um, so um, in terms of daily practices that we were able to, um, to, to capture through ethnographic research, it had to do with things like um, suddenly you go to a vegetable seller and they say we don't sell to Christians. Now, I'm not saying that religious discrimination hasn't existed in Egypt for a very, very long time and suddenly emerged under the Muslim Brotherhood. Certainly not. It has its historical roots. But it just intensified. It got much worse during that year. So, 30th of June. 2013. This is an image that probably did not appear on your uh, television screens or did not appear regularly on, um, on front page newspapers in the West. It is interesting that on the 30th of June 2013, the number of Egyptians who went out against President Morsi's regime was by far larger than 2011. Even though in 2011 you had something like 40 BBC correspondents in Tahir Square. 2013, nobody really covered, who are these people? Now, these are actually, these little dots are millions. Who are these people out on the street? What did they want? Uh, my point is not to say that uh, the regime in place now is a democratic regime, but it is to say we need to understand the pulse of the citizenry. We need to understand why people rose a year after President Morsi. Now, these can't be Copts, because Copts constitute 10% of the population. And these scenes you saw across the entire country in Egypt, not just in Tahir Square. So we did a survey in 2014. We took a sample of 2,400 people. I'm happy to, uh, for those that are interested in the methodology, to discuss the methodology afterwards, because I'm running out of time, and I don't want to bore you with uh, with data set and, and the combination of quantitative and qualitative, but I'm happy to share afterwards. We took a sample, and uh, of those who rose against the regime, um, they were about 80% uh, Muslim, 20% Christian. They were 50% rural, 50% urban, 50% women, 50% men. Um, and we did, through snowballing, um, um, we, did a, we, we asked them, why did they rise? I won't share with you the full uh, results of a, of a very long survey, but I will share with you just two things. Why did people rise? Now, the number one, the highest one, 35.8% said the brotherhoodization of the state. What did they mean by the brotherhood, brotherhoodization of the state? They basically meant that there was a monopolization of political power, social power, economic power in the hands of the Muslim Brotherhood, which they did not expect. In other words, when they had elected President Morsi into office, they had expected him to create an inclusive political order and social order. The second reason is economic situation deteriorated. The, the situation in Egypt continues to be dire economically, uh, but why the Muslim Brotherhood uh, probably, uh, why people probably cited this as number two is because the Muslim Brotherhood had created very high expectations among the Egyptian people. You'll be fully, you, you, you'll all have jobs, you'll all have homes, blah, blah, blah. So by raising these expectations, when, when people didn't see things happening, uh, there was this sense of frustration. The third reason is security, not feeling safe. Um, and the, the variation between the, the, the Christians and Muslims in these results was very minor. In other words, these were the top three for both Muslims and Christians. The issue of security is very important, but when we talk about security, 
um, it's not just um, uh, when we talk, when we did our focus groups, what do you mean by am security? How do you feel it? How do you experience it? Um, it wasn't just uh, a question of um, um, seeing a policeman on the street. I was going to use gender sensitive language and say policewoman, but we have very few in Egypt. Um, you know, but it was also questions of social cohesion. It's also questions of feeling that you're part of a community, that the community will stand up for you. Um, and that kind of cohesion, because of that Islamist discourse of we are in power, we will rule, we will show you what an Islamist um, state looks like, we will tell you how to live, ruptured the social cohesion even for Muslims who are devout Muslims, but who did not necessarily follow the Muslim Brotherhood version of what Islam is. And I think that's a really important point to raise. The, the, the theme of today's um, engagement is pluralism because I believe that when um, ideologies uh, touch on uh, religious pluralism and gender equality, they also affect the rights of uh, those of the majority faith, but who do not necessarily want to live in a particular conform to the majority. Artists, Muslims who don't want to practice Islam in a certain way, um, atheists, uh, others who um, uh, are Muslim but belong to leftist movements or belong to youth revolutionary movements. So this idea of a homogenizing impact undermines pluralism in its multi-faceted expressions, whether it's gender or religion or um, tolerance for those that express their faith differently or have no faith. Now, of course, uh, there is another narrative that says, yes, okay, we recognize that millions of Egypt, Egyptians rose against the regime, but they didn't want the regime to be out of power. They just wanted there to be reform. When we asked people, this was not the case. Um, the majority, 69%, said we, when we went out on the 30th of June 2013, we asked for President Morsi to step down. We asked for President Morsi to leave. Now, it is true that in our questionnaire, we did not ask, did you want a CC to come to power? At that time, the presidential elections had not happened. Um, uh, but I think it is extremely important to recognize that Egyptians were expressing, just like they did in 2011, their rejection of a leader that they felt had lost legitimacy in their, in, in their eyes. So, as you know, just for those that, that sort of following the uprising, you had something called a roadmap. In that picture, you will have um, to your far, um, what's the side? Right? Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, the, to your utmost right, you would have the um, patriarch of the Coptic Orthodox Church. Next to him, the head of Al-Assar institution. Next to him, a military man. Um, but then you'll also find in that crowd um, uh, uh, Muhammad al-Baradai, the Nobel Prize winner, who did actually take part in the negotiations to oust Morsi, and who did, and we have this on record, agree for Morsi to step down. Um, and, uh, and a variety of other political forces, including the judiciary. In that, they agreed to a roadmap in which there will be uh, first parliamentary elections and then presidential elections. One of the major uh, mistakes that happened in Egypt was that we actually reversed them. We had presidential elections first, then parliamentary elections. But um, uh, following the ousting of President Morsi, we had, uh, in terms of space and time, the worst uh, ever physical assault on uh, faith-based, Christian faith-based, uh, places of worship, schools, orphanages, bookshops um, that we've ever seen in a long part of Egypt's history. Now, of course, there have been always cases of sectarian assault, but to actually lose um, 64 places that were torched or looted or both in 72 hours was exceptional. I mean, you know, this is a... a we, we probably lost about 3% of, of, of the, 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 the number of faith-based establishments in 72 hours. Uh, this was initiated by the Muslim Brotherhood and the Pro-Morsi 
uh, group in retaliation for uh, the security's excessive use of violence against their demonstrations um, um, in um, Rabah Square um, uh, and Adawiya Square in Egypt. So you had a case in which some of the demonstrators were armed, they were using violence, and then the police used excessive violence out of which hundreds of Muslim Brotherhood members lost their lives. Um, but there was no explanation of why would they start attacking places of worship and institutions which um, certainly were not, you know, had made it clear they're not pro Morsi, but had never actually lifted, had never engaged in any physical violence against the Muslim Brotherhood or had not even mobilized against the Muslim Brotherhood. So the, the, the price was actually very, very high, but there wasn't a retaliation. In other words, the instructions given to Copts was, do not leave your homes, do not try to stop the torching of the churches. If they get burned, so be it, but let's not engage in any um, armed engagement. And I think that was a, a really important step that, that otherwise the country could have turned into a great deal of violence. So, what does this mean for the current situation? What does this mean for the post-2013? I think there, there has been a reversal of the brotherhoodization trend, you know, the number one reason why people revolted. But we are very concerned about the Salafization. Salafization comes from the word Salafi, which refers to the ultra-radical movement that has now spread globally um, and has extremely um, influential bases of learning across the world, and obviously has one of its strongest bases in Egypt. Um, the fact that citizenship is no longer mediated by religion um, in daily life has made a huge difference. There is no longer this discourse of just you wait, we will show you, or now that we are in power, uh, we will show you. Um, but uh, there is concern about the way in which Al-Ashar um, is uh, not supporting inclusive politics. As I mentioned, they had wanted to go for the path of informal mediation. At the time of the Blue Bra woman in 2011, they did not issue a statement condemning such practices. So uh, for those that have always saying, we need the moderate uh, Islamist place of learning to advocate, well, we actually need to start by holding them accountable. Um, and when I say we, we I, I, I'm, I'm talking about... Um, um, about those that are engaged in dialogue with Al Ashar, but I'm also talking about um, uh, Egyptian Muslims who have been trying to hold Al Ashar accountable um, and who have not uh, uh, been supported, who have not been given their their, their due space. Um, I'm I'm going to jump a little bit, uh, um, but just to say the situation today is still one where there are severe encroachments on religious pluralism. Um, blasphemy, blasphemy, laws, blasphemy laws which work like a McCarthy, like witch hunt, or did you say something against Islam, did you say something, even when people haven't said anything, are used constantly to try and, to get, uh, to, to try and con get people condemned and the judiciary is com complicit in this. Um, the idea of the absence of rule of law um, is an issue, but, there is improved social cohesion. I'll give you one very small example from, from the research. In 2012, I was interviewing a very poor day laborer in Menya um, who works on the land. And he was telling me in tears, and it's, it's not common for elderly Egyptian men to cry what they call in the presence of women. Uh, but he was, he was telling me that what upset him most about the changes in the country is that he used to, at, at break time, when they were working in the fields, he used to always have his meals with Muslim, the Muslim laborers in the field. So they used to all get together. Everybody has their food. They all sat together. They would have their meal together. He said in by 2012, they were no longer eating together. Um, and that had created a sense of brokenness in him. You know, these are people, we, we work the land together, why do we not eat together anymore? By 2014, he said, actually, they had started, they had gone back to eating together. You know, somehow, without any formal handshakes or we thereby commit to do this or that, you know, the, just, just informally, people started gelling back together. Now, it doesn't mean as I mentioned, I continue to emphasize that discrimination does not continue to exist, and as we see with the case of the stripping of the woman, 
major issues continue. But it does say that at least in terms of everyday life, that the idea of people reminding themselves of what brought them together is, 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 has been happening since 2013. On women's equality, um, we have seen the largest number of women uh, being um, represented in Egyptian parliament in its history. Um, the average in the, la the parliament that was a Muslim brotherhood or Islamist dominated uh, parliament in 2012 was 3%. Um, but I think more important than the numbers, because we just don't want women to be there in parliament doing nothing or just you know, filling seats, that would be pretty useless. I think the difference is that the women who were in parliament in 2012 were very much not advocating for a pro-women's rights agenda. They were not increasing women's spaces. They were not increasing women's rights. Yes, they did uh, vote in favor of a law that would give uh, female-headed households more economic rights, and that was very commendable. But actually, that law was initially put forward by the feminist movement three or four years earlier. Now, it's good they advocated it, but anything else that had to do with women's um, um, empowerment, in other words, challenging the gender hierarchy, they, had, they were not promoting. And we were, at that time, very worried that female genital mutilation would be decriminalized. Um, what is important is that uh, a, a significant percentage of the women who are now in parliament are actually, or so far, they've only been there for a year or even less than a year, have actually been promoting women's rights. So they did bring the case of Suat Sebet to parliament and they insisted that there be a parliamentary inquiry. And I think that is really important to mention is the importance of... of, um, of not just having representation but looking at what kind of social justice agendas are being advocated. Having said that, sexual harassment does continue, but has improved dramatically. Dramatically. I think part of the reason why it has improved is that the, the, the security laxity that existed is no longer the case. But also, I think partly because the Islamists are no longer in power, because this rhetoric of cover-up, uh, because this rhetoric of uh, um, um, you, can, you can be in the street as long as um, has waned. Uh, does it mean that suddenly Egyptian society has become progressive, pro-women's rights, uh, believing that women should wear anything they wear? Absolutely not. There is still a great deal of patriarchy, there is still a great deal of discrimination, but at least that emboldening of the rhetoric of you don't have the right to the street if you are not complying with us has gone, Tra dramatically, but of course not entirely, because we are still very worried about the impact of salafization. I do want to, to, to talk about what does this mean for the region, what does this mean for Syria, um, what does this mean for Ye Yemen should the civil war end. Um, I think the first thing is ideology does matter. In other words, it's not when we always think of a civil state, the, the first thing that comes to our mind is a, a non-military state. But civil should also mean non-theocratic. Um, and because uh, the Eastern European examples, the Latin American examples have always been struggles against military regimes, we have forgotten that um, that theocracy can also have a devastating impact um, on the quality of democracy, even if it is through a ballot box that it comes to power. Um, the second, and I think this is particularly important for Syria, is that we don't repeat the same mistakes that we have um, been doing in the Middle East, which is we assume that elections and democracy are sa the same thing. Now, I'm not in any stretch of the imagination saying we don't need elections. Of course we do. But elections have to be held at the right time. They have to be held in secure situations where people are not terrorized. Um, and um, political orders still have to be negotiated through consensus so that whoever comes to power doesn't engage in the tyranny of majoritarian democracy where we still have substantive rights for artistic expression, for um, people to choose their faith, for people to exercise equality, uh, and so forth. Um, the third is the danger of regional international power configurations. Now, the situation in 2011 is very different from now. Um, one of the 
um, one of the issues is that there has been um, a Western um, critique of the human rights record of the Egyptian government now. Um, rightly so, there are human rights violations issues that have to be addressed. But the problem is that they also don't recognize that average Egyptians, uh, non-armed civilian Egyptians, are being exposed to terrorist acts. Um, that people are getting blown up. Um, and they're asking, why is it that when people get blown up in the West, there is sympathy, but when we get blown up, nobody cares? Now, I'm just sort of trying to convey the pulse of the citizenry in Egypt. You know, this was said to me by the hairdresser. Um, you know, he said to me, I don't understand it. You, know, you live in the West, you live in the UK, tell me. You know, I fully sympathize with the people in Belgium who have been blown up. Why is it that when terrorists coming in from Sinai attack us, we're not armed, we're not policemen. Not that he's justifying the attack on policemen, but he's saying, you know, why is it that when we live in daily terror from terrorism, nobody cares? Uh, and it's, it's, I'm, I'm in no way, I'm not partisan to the struggles. I'm just trying as an academic to convey the fact that the situation now has been complicated by the fact that you do have very strong terrorist networks between Libya and Yemen and Syria and Iraq. It's not just ISIS. Um, in, in, in the IDS bulletin that has just been released, um, a very distinguished Islamist writer, uh, who was actually part of the, the jihadi movement, um, has an article, and it's free of access. Um, let me know if you need a copy, it's, but it's also available online. He's writing that these are intricate networks that have actually been able to establish a very strong base in the region since 2011. So this in no way, this in no way suggests that we don't need human rights, but it is to say that we also need to take into account that as long as there are these threats, um, security will unfortunately sometimes trump issues of human rights and we need to be able to create a balance for both so that we have pluralism and respect for rights um, but that also recognizes the rights of all. Um, I, I want to go back to an earlier point which is I, I still think that one of the missing links in this puzzle and this is the last point. Thank you for being so patient and I hope you don't need Panadol for headaches. Um, is the, the question of the role of Al-Ashar because uh, the role of Al-Ashar is uh, not just one that is influential in Egypt. It is influential in the whole of the Sunni world. And um, um, when we talk about a counter-narrative to the radical narrative of ISIS and Islamist, radical Islamist movements, I don't think it's good enough anymore to say, well, ISIS does not speak in the name of Islam. We need to take that step further and say, well, actually, we no longer recognize them as Muslims anymore. Um, and there has been a reluctance to go that step, and I think it's important because it sets out what kind of message. Um, just like in the case of the women who are being stripped, we should expect Al-Ashar to come out and say, we are against any measure by any actor that takes away from women's dignity um, and bodily integrity, um, and that this right should be unqualified. Whether you are protesting, whether you are Copt or Muslim, this is a right for all. Um, and I think that that is a struggle, and perhaps we can revisit it again. Uh, but on a very, very final note, and I promise this is very final, um, I think I want to go back to this point. Something very interesting happened in Egyptian society in 2011 and 2016. In 2011, this picture here is, um, it's one of the graffiti pictures that was on one of the walls, I think in Tahir Square. But what happened was that people started celebrating this woman as a hero, as a heroine. You know, a woman who was stripped of her clothes, which in Egyptian culture is a source of shame, is a source of, you know, dishonor to herself, to her family in traditional patriarchal society, became suddenly celebrated as a heroine. Uh, the, 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 the slogans that people were saying in the protests that I went on and was trying to laboriously comment was, raise your head high, you are most honorable um, than any of them. And this was 
sung by men and women. And I think this was so important because it showed a social transformation. Men and women saying, we will not allow ourselves to fall into the trap of political struggles happening on women's bodies and in the name of honor, accept it. And I, this is the kind of resistance movement that I, I think is very powerful because it comes from the bottom up. It's not the people doing the blah, 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 blah in conferences. It's, it's the Egyptian people. You know? The second one has to do with the response to Suad Sebet, the Coptic woman, in which when, the, when there were attempts uh, by some uh, Islamist leaning, not necessarily Muslim Brotherhood, but Islamist leaning um, individuals say, well, let's not exaggerate. The cops are trying to cause um, divisions in society. Uh, let's, you know, maybe she wasn't stripped, all of that kind of discourse. You had uh, Muslims united with Christians in saying, we will not accept this. This is unacceptable. This is shameful for the Egyptian people to have seen this happen in their society, and we want justice for this woman, who then was given the title of Sayyidat al minya the Lady of Minya. So instead of being the stripped woman of Minya, she was given socially the title of the Lady of Minya. Um, and so in the midst of turbulence, chaos, there are struggles, um, there are demands, for equality, and um, I think we can probably talk a little bit more about it um, in our discussions later on because I want to stop here. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>